Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day just to be alive. We thank you for the gift of life, and we thank you for the health that we do have, the ability to breathe, to see, to hear, to taste, to smell. We just thank you that you've given life so much color and enjoyment. Help us not take these things for granted. And Father, we ask that you bless this message. We know it is of your spirit. We want to hear your spirit's message for us tonight. And we ask that you help us understand the things you have for us, as only you can do. And most of all, Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, out of heaven to become one of us so that he could take the place of all mankind on the cross. So that whoever believes in him will be saved by grace. We ask your blessing upon everything that goes on tonight. It's in Christ's precious name we pray. By the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen. Okay. The Gospel, Salvation and Sanctification, Part 116. We're almost done with this series, it appears. And Sunday was a wonderful message. I'm going to recap some of that message uh, on two fronts. And let me start by saying that as we press on as good soldiers of Christ Jesus, not entangling ourselves in the affairs of everyday life, and continually learning from the Word and the Spirit, it seems... We have spiritual highs and lows, so to speak, at times. We will have times that we're emotionally charged regarding the truths we're learning, and we'll have times where we need to simply stand firm or stay the course. So I'd like to begin with this statement on the board that came up on Sunday. The spiritual life is an endurance race, not a sprint. The spiritual life is an endurance race, not a sprint. As we saw two weeks ago now, the race we are involved in does involve becoming all things to all men so that we might win some souls. We saw that in context in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And make no mistake, we're still called to run a race, but it is an endurance race. It's not a sprint. And it's not something where we should overreact and even operate out of our human will to achieve God's plan and our own power somehow. So this is a journey which the Lord in his patience is taking us on. And he leads us perfectly. If we're listening, we receive that perfect path. And the Lord even accounts for our own stubbornness and imperfections along the way by grace. But he does lead us perfectly. We also heard from the Spirit on Sunday this perspective. Just because some have been moved by the Spirit to accelerate in certain areas of their lives at this time, it doesn't mean that others are being called to do the exact same thing. Pretty clear message. I mean, how do we know what direction the Spirit might be taking others in? Even the people that sit right next to us. We clearly don't. And thank God, you know, we can't <laughs> be in somebody else's head, right? But we don't know their soul. We don't know what they're battling, going through spiritually. Uh, we don't know what they're reconciling to their own soul to, as truth and what they're pushing away. So we pray for one another and give some space because we clearly don't know. Not only do we not walk in each other's shoes all day long, but most of us here, even though we're tight family, we don't even know what each of us are doing throughout our days, if you think about it. I mean, we don't have time to even show up at church and say, what did you do today? Tell me everything that happened, right? Right? And you think about what's happened in your life right now in the last eight, ten hours today. And every day is different, and there's a lot of little events, a lot of little decisions. It's impossible to know what the other person is walking in 
even that very day. So we each have to walk our own path and fight our own battles. That only we can experience and live. And no one else can live our lives for us. It's a calling between each person and the Lord. So we need to remember that, right? In humility. But the tendency of the flesh is to judge. Isn't it? I mean, okay, maybe you don't do it with your mouth, but I think we all do it sometimes, somehow. We tend to jump to conclusions by what we see even though we don't see most of the other person's day, ironically. So let's guard against that and allow the Spirit to work in and lead each person in the area of emphasis they're called to at that time. All right, again, the point on the board. Just because some have been moved by the Spirit to accelerate in certain areas of their lives at this time, it doesn't mean that others are being called to do the exact same. And Pastor shared this with us a couple times from uh, the blog, The Last One in Syndrome. Living for others means having the wisdom to understand the nuances here. It means always considering others in whatever we say or do. That's why over time, when emotions die down, true wisdom sets in. And a person transitions from being a potential liability to the kingdom to an asset. Patience, my friends. And I personally have had to learn from this point on the board. For example, and I hope this makes sense, but this is how it came to me. If your eyes shift to others that you're called to serve, don't forget the others in your family you may be affecting, especially if you're called to a different area of ministry. In other words, be considerate of all people in your periphery, not taking anybody for granted as we often do, right? And getting overly familiar with our friends, for example. Be considerate of all in your periphery that you might be affecting. And don't let emotions, or don't let the emotions of where God is leading you affect others negatively somehow. And that's what the Spirit was saying on on the last couple messages, actually. Um, It may be unintentional, but we are to be mature and step back and say, how might I be affecting others? Even with this positive thing, whatever this thing is, you know, we've been talking about evangelism and such, but how might I be affecting others and um, do I need to be careful not to make somebody stumble? And again, we mustn't allow an attitude of judging to sneak into our souls, being the last one in syndrome, quote unquote. Epiphany, we've all had them. Revelation, right? Oh, I get it now, right? Wow, I see it. How could I not see that? You know, thank you, Lord, for showing me this thing. Don't you see it? Why don't you see it? What's your problem? You've got to catch up to me. And that's what we do. Maybe in, you know, a good heart in our excitement, but also maybe the flesh is creeping in there. Who are we to get on our high horse and look down our nose at others just because we finally, ourselves, op- you know, had our eyes open to something? And I'm not saying that's what's happening here in the church, but there's a tendency even of the flesh to do this, even at points of spiritual growth. The flesh can even turn a good thing into a bad thing, as we know, if we let it sneak in. So the additional perspective the Spirit is giving us is patience. It's quite possible that God will convict you to wait on His timing to do this or that. Do not ever ignore His convictions. Whether or not it seems rational that you should be doing something or not, don't ignore His convictions. He might be teaching something from the pulpit, like evangelism. Right, And he might call you to wait on that thing you just learned. He might call you to uh, dwell on it for a certain period of time and pray on it for a certain period of time where other people might be called and, and led by the Spirit to stop sitting on their butt and go out right now. 
because that's what they need, and that's what the Spirit's telling them to do. So at times, it's possible that God will convict you to wait on his timing to do what's being taught from the pulpit. It's definitely possible. I mean, you think of all the souls in this room and all the souls listening online. Uh, We don't even know really how many, but the Spirit's teaching this general message to our church at this time, and it may or may not be for everybody to apply at that very moment, whatever the topic is. So on the board, remember those who are teaching you and that they, ha- they are teaching a very broad range of believers. And prayer is the key for your personal application. And prayer will lead you into his timing. That's the important thing. So on Sunday, Pastor mentioned he's guarding against something he's calling evangelizing. And it's pretty funny. When one person feels pressured by another to go out and evangelize a certain way. And the problem with that is that there are infinite ways to accomplish the Great Commission. I really believe infinite is the proper word. I mean, we think we can put a number on how a spiritual gift can operate, for example. Every pastor in human history has been led to operate their gifts slightly differently than every other pastor, for example. And God's infinite, and every soul is unique and different, and every personality unique and different, just part of how wonderful he is. But when one person feels pressured by another to go out and evangelize a certain way, that might not be right for them. They may have a different calling on the same subject, for example, the Great Commission. Some may have small audiences, while others large, Some are public ministry, some are private. The Spirit decides. 1 Corinthians 12, 5 through 7. Some of you may inadvertently be guilty of evangelist shaming, so be sensitive to this issue. At this point, I have to say, Hi, my name is Scott. I'm an evangelist shamer. And my apologies come with that. I do this lightheartedly. Uh, I believe I have an encouraging heart, and that does get the best of me at times. So I do apologize if I uh, overstepped any bounds with anybody. <laughs> but as Paul has said, I seek the benefit to your account. You know, that obviously is, is my um, interest and desire is to see uh, each person experience some of the things that, you know, I I get to experience, and it's part of my gift, I understand that, but I want to have people share in these different things, so sometimes I get a little too excited, maybe. Regardless, if I've done this to anybody in my excitement, I do apologize, seriously. The Spirit of Christ is not one of condemnation, as we know, And I pray I never made anybody feel condemned for not following in my footsteps in evangelism. As someone with the gift of evangelism, it took me forever to have my eyes opened to how simple obedience is called regarding this great commission and how we're not to overcomplicate it and um, wait on God's timing forever, let's say. So my enthusiasm seeing God's plan in a greater clarity and simplicity and in my request for some Barnabases, if you remember, to help me a couple months ago, I may have evangelized some, but it was unintentional. And I know you all know that. So show me some grace, would you? We all have unique lives to live as unto the Lord. And that's what we're learning and that's what we um, each need to humbly accept Uh, as opposed to, like I said, jumping to conclusions, Um, you know, maybe even pushing somebody along. You might think you're doing the right thing, but everyone has unique lives to live and unique ministries. And how long has the Spirit been telling us that we all have our own pulpits? Years, right? I, I, I guess five years. And that was way before the gospel reload that we just went through. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 5. Let's be reminded again 
of the uniqueness of our ministries. We're all called to the Great Commission, but we all have different gifts. And so the response to that call would, would be, will be in different forms. 1 Corinthians 12, 5. And there are varieties of ministries, infinite even, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Each one. Each one's different, in other words. Slightly, somehow. So whenever any one of us has an epiphany in any area of our spiritual lives, really, we must be careful that our encouragement doesn't turn into guilt or condemnation towards others. And that's part of truly and humbly living for others. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard lesson for some of us, or a long lesson. And so we here at North Christian Church, under our pastor's guidance, will be posting the current evangelism opportunities both on the website and on the bulletin board in the back, so that whoever wants to participate can decide on their own and let whoever's leading that area uh, know that they want to participate without undue pressure. Over a month ago, as you remember, I personally asked for some Barnabases. And I appreciate those of you who were led, led out at that point to help me out, uh, to go out in twos, for example, or more. And it's been wonderful. It's been fun. And my prayer is that the Spirit did that in you and not any wrong motivation. But at the same time, whether it was or it wasn't, we're all moving forward. We're not called to look back and dwell on things in the past. We're not, we can learn from our mistakes, but now we're moving forward. And hopefully all relying on the Spirit for His leading in our part on the Great Commission, each one of us. So if you do receive encouragement from someone regarding the Great Commission, just remember the following that we saw on Sunday regarding patience again. Do not confuse encouragement from others as commandments from the Spirit. Conviction to do in the spiritual life, for example, to go forward, your conviction to go forward in what you're learning, that must be from the Holy Spirit, not even man's encouragement. While encouragement is good, As in Hebrews 3.13, we mustn't try to mimic one another's calling. That's why prayer is so important. Even if it's a quick prayer, even if you think you think it's something for you, but shouldn't we always consult the Spirit even when we think it's right for us? How many times you've been wrong? You thought it was right and you rushed into it and then you're like, ah, why did I rush into that? If I only literally stopped for a minute and prayed about it, he he may have told me to wait a minute or an hour or a week or whatever, right? So prayer is key. We mustn't try to mimic another's calling. Just make sure it's from the Spirit for you at that time. And if he says yes, go for it. Guns a-blazing. How many times has the Spirit told us to be ourselves? Not our fleshly selves, of course, which would be an excuse to not obey the Lord's commands. But he has said over and over from this pulpit, be yourself. God designed you a certain way with a gift for certain things, which includes reaching others in unique ways in your own pulpit. So again, on the board, please do not get in the way of the Spirit's convicting ministry in your life. Just listen in either direction, whether it's to go out now or to have patience. Take a moment, pray about it, and listen. And if you really want the answer, he'll show show you. He'll convict you. And we want his answer. We don't want our answer. We don't want to do it for the wrong reasons, whatever it is. Just like we should pray about anything we learn at Bible class, For when and how the Spirit wants us to act, the same goes for when we receive encouragement from others in our family who might have good intentions but might be overzealous 
of anti-shaming. So let's remember in grace that man does fail encouragement. Since man is flawed, he tends to overstep his boundaries when trying to encourage others in the spiritual life. Receive encouragement, but diligently sort it out with the Spirit before doing anything. Encouragement's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, seriously, that, that's one of the main benefits and purposes of the church. We come back here, we get all beat up out there, we come back, we regroup. The Spirit from night to night has different people that we're, we're meant to run into at church and even speak to or be encouraged by, and vice versa, to encourage. So it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And yet when you get that encouragement... Take it with a grain of salt, pray about it, and see if that's something you should act on. That's all. It's pretty simple, right? So this is one reason we're assigned a pastor and a local assembly, to hear from the Word and the Spirit, to equip us and guide us into His path for us. Regardless of how you go out to evangelize people, remember that the Bible speaks in great detail about the churches and their importance, not just the church as a whole, capital C. I love this reminder the Spirit gave us on Sunday regarding the local church. Most converts are already addicts, addicted to the world system. For years, they've been intoxicated by it. So just because a person gets, quote-unquote, clean through a detox program, for example, they become saved, it doesn't mean they're no longer tempted. Recovered addicts require support programs. Spiritual addicts require churches. I mean, you think about people that you've met that have lived in the world for years and decades and are now at least maybe seeking the Lord, seeking truth, or maybe they've become a believer, but they have all that garbage to deal with, right? Just like we've all had that garbage to deal with in our souls that he slowly getting out of us, through training us. Where does he train us? At the local church. We're assigned to a pastor, right? By the scripture. And so, all those addictions we have to the world system, they got to be weaned out, scraped off, uh, sometimes beaten out of us, uh, sometimes graciously coaxed out of us by the Spirit, out of love. But whatever it is, we all have this situation. All we, do, all we get to do is look in the mirror, right? And think about our past. And so we have a new believer who's in that boat. And now they jumped in this boat, Christ's boat, for salvation. And they still get all that garbage to deal with. And so we can help them by personally mentoring them, but also by connecting them with the local church, remembering how important it is and how everybody needs a under-shepherd. So on the board is a wonderful perspective that we should remember as we encounter new believers or even those who are seeking the truth. They need to be led and taught the word so they can live the spiritual life and avoid the trappings of idols in this world as we all need our whole time on this planet. This, by the way, remember, is part of making disciples. It's part of the Great Commission. What did the Lord say at the end of the Great Commission? Teaching them to obey all the Lord's commands. Why do we conveniently forget that part? Why do we think giving the gospel is the end when it's only the beginning? He said, teach them to obey all my commands. How are we going to do that if we give them a track and run, so to speak? How will we teach them all his commands if we don't follow up? How will they learn all his commands if they don't find the right shepherd to sit under for them, whoever they're called to? So as we go out and obey the Lord's great commission, each in our own lives in different ways, let us not forget the importance of the local church and submitting to a pastor who has been ordained by God to teach and lead others. If people forget the value and need of the local assembly, Satan loves it, just loves it. Leave them floundering, flopping out there like a fish out of water in the world. 
just leave them to their own. It's their problem, right? And that's what our flesh says at times. Good, they're saved. God will take care of them. And maybe God wanted you to stay in the path and teach them to obey all his commands. Give them some guidance to the right place to learn and grow. The local church mission. Once a person is saved, their first objective is to keep on learning the word of God and imagine the attacks. Some of us just have to think back to the attacks that we went through when we first turned to the Lord. If and when we evangelize someone, we ought to encourage them to attend a sound church under a sound pastor, such as here at North Christian Church. Our relationship with new believers shouldn't end after the gospel presentation. I've had to learn this over the years as an evangelist, that it's not about, you know, going out and tallying up the amount of souls you can save or just getting them in the boat, but it's about making them disciples. It's about caring for them. It's about um, shepherding them in whatever way you're called to. So our relationship with new believers shouldn't end after the gospel presentation. Jesus and the apostles formed relationships. They were willing not to just give the gospel, but to lead and share and encourage, teaching people to obey all the Lord's commands. Think about the scriptures. Think about the letters of the apostles, especially Paul. They gave their hearts to these people. They literally allowed their hearts to break for these people. They didn't uh, disengage so they wouldn't have to be hurt by the things that they would do even against them directly. They engaged fully in the love of Christ, with the love of Christ. They gave their hearts to these people as the scripture reveals their ongoing concern for the growth and welfare of God's new children. Paul was torn apart. He never disengaged. He was so um, on top of his converts, on top of the new church. He was so diligent. He didn't want them to get washed away in the wrong direction. So that's a great example to us. And whether your selfish flesh likes it or not, we're all called to invest in eternal relationships with people. With people. Not just God. And say, okay, I'm going to heaven, Lord. This is all your work. If you want me to talk to someone, bring them to me, but I'm resting that you're going to do all the work. In direct disobedience to the Great Commission. So our flesh doesn't always like to invest in people. But realize that's coming from the flesh. That's not Christ in you. And remember, it will be to your own blessing too. We were taught this two weeks ago in the Giving the Gospel series. Being more blessed to give than to receive. If you invest in somebody you will reap the rewards also. You will become a partaker in the gospel also. And you will have blessings that you never would experience in any other way in this life other than by following through with someone and and investing in them. And there's where we have true blessings, true peace, true happiness, true joy. And again, your eyes are taken off yourself when you do that, right? What a wonderful... Great relief, as we called it. Great relief. All from investing in others. The fruit is just wonderful. But are you willing to obey that part of the Great Commission? So our dear pastor encouraged us to not become lopsided. Do not forget where you came from. God prepared all of you for the battlefield Consider how much work has been done inside these four walls. Do not forget where you came from. North Christian Church is like a FOB, forward operating base, 
in the military. Soldiers must be trained and retrained after they're enlisted. I was thinking about all we've learned, especially over the last couple of years, being set free from certain man-made doctrines, being set free by the fullness of the gospel and the simple, wonderful calling of the Great Commission on our lives and knowing our purpose. All these things we've been set free from, we can't be familiar with these things. We can't how, so quickly forget all the wonderful things that got us to where we are now and where we got those things from. We've been so blessed, really. And the Spirit has patiently and beautifully adjusted our course. And our ship now is going more towards the true north of God than ever before. And we'll never be perfect, but He keeps steering us more and more towards true north. And we should be extremely thankful. And this is all because of the local assembly. Instead of us each trying to find our own way in disobedience to God's word by not sitting under a pastor. So, the local assembly and a faithful, humble pastor like we have who listens to the Spirit's guidance, even in the face of headwinds pounding the ship, which many of you have no idea the type of pressures that come with being in the ministry. I mean, it's so um, constant, kind of like a, a strong headwind. You know, if you, you try to walk up a hill when the wind's blowing right at your face. It's kind of like that, but spiritually, attacks on, your, on the soul and all that kind of thing. And yet we should be very thankful we have uh, someone who just doesn't let that, you know, get in the way and follows the Spirit. And we've been so blessed, just look at the teachings. So we should be very thankful and look forward to all that we will be given here, God willing. We must never forget the importance of this thing and this unit that we're called to. And finally, let's be reminded of the trappings of pride and avoiding putting others into that temptation. And this doesn't mean finally we're closing, by the way. It means we're almost into the second part of the lesson. Aren't you glad? We're only going to go an hour and a half tonight. Patience. Perfect timing. Patience. One of the greatest tragedies that the Bible counsels us against is encouraging someone who's not actually being led by the Spirit to do something that others might be led by the Spirit to do. Pride is what falsely motivates people outside of God's will, even in the church. It's quite easy to appeal to someone's pride, even when it comes to the spiritual life and doing things. I know I've done good things before in the church out of pride. I know I have. We probably all have to some degree because no man's motivation is perfect. If we cause others to give in to that temptation, the result is never going to be good, as we saw on Sunday, regarding motivating pride. If a person succumbs, they do something that is wood, hay, and straw in 1 Corinthians 3.12. We'll all have some of that when we get to heaven. If a person refuses to do, then their sense of pride makes them stumble, as in 1 Corinthians 8.9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Again, when you have that epiphany, whatever it is, don't let your excitement and emotion push something on another that might not be ready to handle it. And we don't want to tempt their pride, ever. Because it's right there at the door, waiting, waiting to pounce. And we never want to put someone in a position of guilt or condemnation, of course. Even saying good things of encouragement can put someone on the spot and make them feel guilty or prideful. So may we just learn to think of others before we speak. What a concept. Be slow to speak. Remember that verse? Be slow to speak. So on the board... Let's keep encouraging one another without putting others on the spot. And all that takes is being considerate of others 
and the reality of their individual callings. If you think about it, especially in America, it's natural for us to appeal to somebody's pride. That's our weakness as a land, we might say. The pride and arrogance that we have, mostly due to all that God gave us by grace. But the problem is the word natural. It's natural for us to appeal to someone's pride. It's not spiritual. So we must be on guard for the world's ways creeping in to the church and on guard guard for the flesh, tempting somebody's pride. We saw also a house divided. Satan is looking for every opportunity to divide this church. Again, he's creeping at the door, waiting for anything to cause division. He's intelligent and crafty enough to capitalize even on good things. He's really good at sowing perversion. And remember, perversion means taking something good and twisting it, right? He's so good at that. And so even when we're going through good things and encouragement and growth, we be on guard because that's when he wants to disrupt the momentum that he's building with us. He wants to disrupt the glory that we're bringing to God, however he can. He'll use one person sometimes, and both parties have to be alert, the one being tempted and the one who might listen to someone who goes astray. So let me say this. Not only should no one be evangel-shaming, but also those who might be the recipients of this must be on guard for resentfulness, and harboring bitterness toward the one who may have offended them. On the board. Harbor no bitterness. None. There's a verse in the Bible that says, don't let a a root of bitterness spring up. That means not even a little bit. Don't let that weed break the surface of the soil. No bitterness. To give in to hypersensitivity is never good. Always fall back on giving grace, as you like to receive in your stupid moments. So if someone was stupid toward you, if someone was a little overexcited toward you, put you on the spot, whatever, give them grace. Don't hold on to any bitterness. Forgive them and move on and be set free. Be set free from any of these things that can cause division. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27, and verse 30 through 32. Turn to Ephesians 4, 25. Again, harbor no bitterness. To give in to hypersensitivity is never good. Always fall back on giving grace as you like to receive in your stupid moments. Don't let Satan set up a divide, even in the sight of a man's obvious failures. Ephesians 4.25 Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Jump to verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, all of it, along with malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. What a great summary that verse is. Don't give in to bitterness. Don't give in to hypersensitivity. It's very tempting because we want it to be all about ourselves. Let's stand united, treating others in grace, and loving one another unconditionally, despite when we fail one another. Maybe even especially when we fail one another. On the board, 
United we stand. I think of Pastor twirling around in his chair giving the salute to Satan, as he said many times. That's what I am thinking of right now. United we stand. Don't let him sneak in and spoil our liberty and our love and our unity and the grace. Let's give no room for Satan's schemes. And remember that love conquers all. And Satan has no weapon that can be successful against the power of God's love. He has no hope against the power of God's love. So that's where we stand united. And we fall back on that thing, especially when we fail one another. We must love one another till the end, until the Lord calls us home. Amen? On the board, 1 Corinthians 13, 8, part A, love never fails. We can't fail if we fall back on love. And in verse 13, B, the greatest of these is love. All right, so that being said, really on supporting one another and tempting one another, etc., let's change gears a little bit as we get close to the end here of the message. We only have 45 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, only 15 minutes, relax. But we're changing gears, and we're going to get back into sanctification. And uh, this is where I think the Spirit's going to be going forward from this point. But sanctification is a process. As we heard on Sunday, we were reminded it's not just a one-time event, especially from man's limited perspective. But it is very good and healthy spiritually for us to consider God's perspective on sanctification, even though we're limited and we can't grasp it all. Because you, we can't grasp it all, we shouldn't be shy to entertain God's perspective. You know, don't be scared that you're not going to get it all, so I'm not even going to try to look at it from God's point of view. God's perspective is what sets us free, and the Spirit is working with those who are humble. So step back, look at the big picture. As God sees everything looking down from heaven. I mean, picture yourself where God is. Picture yourself looking at the earth from God's viewpoint and seeing it all as truth in one fail swoop, without even time getting in the way. And that's the area we should endeavor to venture into, because the Spirit will give us glimpses as we are humbly following. In fact, when we do that, we realize the following perspective. To God, sanctification is a reality, not something on a timeline. This is why, from our perspective, we might rightly say, to be saved is to be sanctified, and to be sanctified is to be saved. That's a new perspective. Go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. We need to take one more look at this verse, because even the Spirit, uh, when I was studying for this lesson, I was going to take this verse out, because we've already been here uh, two or three times. And he said, no, 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 put it, keep it in. And then after keeping it in, he revealed something else you know, to me to share. And this, I mean, obviously, the Word of God is just endless. But the Spirit wanted us to go over this one more time and look at one more thing. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is so much in that passage. As we read in context, we can see this is one big picture in God's eyes. Salvation, sanctification, glory even. Not only do we see salvation is through sanctification, but we also see in verse 14, it was for sanctification that he called us through the gospel. It was for sanctification that he called us through the gospel. What's the gospel for? 
you'd say salvation, right? But it was for sanctification he called us through the gospel so that we might gain what? The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's more than just salvation. That's all three phases of sanctification. We receive his glory positionally by grace through faith. We experience his glory even though we shouldn't as we follow him and ultimately in heaven. We have his glory. We possess his glory forever. But it was for sanctification that he called us through the gospel. And glorification is part of ultimate sanctification. So again, we can say the point on the board. To God, sanctification is a reality, not something on a timeline. This is why, from our perspective, we might rightly say, to be saved is to be sanctified, and to be sanctified is to be saved. It's all one big, I don't know what it is. It's all one. <laughs> it's all one. Why do we try to break so many things apart? Why do we try to um, cordon things off the way we do? Why do we overly divide the word of truth? We love to get in the way. We love to figure everything out and be in control of everything. But to be saved is to be sanctified. And to be sanctified is to be saved. Because God does it all. He never fails any part of it. He completes everything he started. In view of God's big picture perspective on salvation and sanctification, again on the board we saw this on Sunday, salvation is a function of sanctification. Sanctification is a function of salvation. Welcome to the supernatural. I love it. Welcome to the supernatural. Instead of being confused at all by what's on the board, how about just saying, wow, how wonderful that is. And only God could set it up like this. Maybe this is a different perspective than what you've learned in the past, but so be it. That's awesome. And you know what? If it's simpler, that's a, that's a good sign. Anytime we're willing to admit that we can't fully grasp the things of God, we're on the right track in humility. And therefore, the more we put things in His hands, the more we trust Him for the results. So, leave the supernatural things up to faith. Isn't that awesome? Leave the supernatural things up to faith. Don't worry about the details. We walk by faith and not by sight. So there's wonderful freedom in walking by faith and not having to figure everything out or control everything. Again, there's wonderful freedom in walking by faith and not having to figure everything out or control everything. Sounds like the faith of a child to me. What do you think? Stop trying to control everything. I think of a carefree child running around playing, trusting their parents for everything, even oblivious of the problems around them. Five years old, listen, the house could be almost taken. You don't even know it. Your parents might be struggling to get food for dinner. You don't even know it. And why don't you care? Because you trust that they're going to figure something out. They're my parents. They're my father. They're my mother, whatever. But how much more we have our perfect Heavenly Father? He's going to provide everything. So... That's where he's taking us, you know? The Spirit has been pushing for us to walk by faith and not try to figure everything out, to have the faith of a child. That's why one emailer said last month they feel like they're on a working vacation. That's why the Bible tells us to rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice.
on the board. Rejoice, child. Rejoice. In spite of the pressures of life and even the good things we do in God's plan, we are never to worry or be anxious, but just rejoice always with the faith of a child because our Heavenly Father has already given us the victory by grace. Do you believe that? Not always. Guilty. But should we be reconciling this to our own soul maybe a little bit? Contemplating this and going to your father if you have to in a um, direct manner, shall we say? In spite of the pressures of life, even the good things we do in God's plan, we're never to worry or be anxious, but just rejoice always with the faith of a child because our Heavenly Father has already given us the victory by grace. Life's challenges are no excuse to disobey this command to rejoice. It's a lame excuse. And you're the one missing out if you use that as an excuse to ignore this command. In fact, the solution to our so-called problems is the way of escape from the temptation of worry and anxiety. What solution? Rejoice always. That's our way of escape. It's amazing how if we just obey his commands, such as rejoice always, everything else becomes easier in life. Even as easy as a little child who is able to trust his parents to take care of everything. That's where he's taking us. Go to Philippians 4, verse 4. Again, life's challenges are no excuse to disobey this command to rejoice. In fact, it's the very solution. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Again on the board. Rejoice, child. Rejoice. That's what God the Father is saying to us. Relax. Rejoice, child. I know it's hard, but rejoice. You know you have the victory through me. You know I'm going to provide just enough. You know I'm going to provide the way of escape also and not tempt you beyond what you're able to bear. Rejoice. Just like Job on, a, on the heap of ashes. Rejoice, child. In spite of the pressures of life, even the good things we do in God's plan, we're never to worry or be anxious. Do you ever get worried or anxious about your service in God's plan? No. <laughs> Try being in the ministry. There's more and more pressures, but whatever your gift is, whatever you commit to before God, before your pastor, whatever you take an oath to do before God, and you start to make it more than it is, you start to build up this thing, and I have to do this now, and oh, I, I, I don't know if I can take it. You're losing your focus on him. Rejoice, child. I'm giving you this privilege to do this thing. I'll provide, I'll provide the strength and energy. Trust me, sometimes before I come up here, I really don't feel like being up here. I'm not in the mood. I'm, I'm not... Um, I may be having some faith issues on some issue. And now, you know, I'm like, I have to give it to God. I'm like, all right, Lord, this is your baby. You know, guide me by your spirit. And he does. He's faithful as long as I get out of the way. But it's the same in any area of ministry. If we become anxious or worried about our service to the Lord, what are we doing? It's the exact opposite of what he hopes we do. He's like, rejoice, child. Go forward and enjoy the fact that I'm letting you serve me, your master and king. So as we go forward in the Great Commission, only if we walk by faith are we going to be set free in the process. 
As we go forward in any gift or service, only if we walk by faith will we be set free in the process, like the faith of a child. Even the Lord's calling on our lives is not meant to be a burden, but a joy. And how can that be? Because He promises to be the power behind it. And in that, we rejoice as His child. Running around in the you know, playground, knowing that our parents are taking care of the house or taking care of dinner or whatever. And how much more we have a Heavenly Father that won't let us go through more than we can handle. It's God's mission. He's the one who called us, and He's the one who causes the growth. This is why, as we close on this point about rejoicing, this is why the apostles rejoiced after they were beaten for the gospel. Rejoice, child, rejoice. How do you rejoice while you're being beaten or after you're in all this pain? Because you suffered for Jesus. Rejoice, I, I got it. I got it. That's why they didn't worry about what they were going to say when they were put in prison and brought before the authorities. You imagine going to prison and being brought before potentially the President of the United States to give you a defense. It, you, either, you either rejoice, child, and let me fill your mouth, or you try to do it your own and live in worry and anxiety. But it's foolishness, right? Rejoice, child. Not only is this the Lord's problem, but as our Father, He must provide for us each and every step of the way, as only a perfect Father can and does. And so we rejoice, like a little child. Cool. Thanks, Dad. I know you got my six. You've done it before. You'll do it again. This thing's not going to kill me. If it does, great. I'm ready to see you. <laughs> But really, you've done it before, you'll do it again, right? And we lose faith. How quickly we lose faith. But just obey this command. Rejoice. The Lord desires us to always be free in our souls as with the faith of a child. Amen? So one more time on the board. In spite of the pressures of life and even the good things we do in God's plan, we are never to worry or be anxious, but just rejoice always with the faith of a child because our Heavenly Father has already given us the victory by grace. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for the guidance and direction of your Spirit and for your truth that sets us free. And we thank you for merging all these principles so that we can connect the dots and consume them and even reconcile them in our own souls. We thank you that you're the one causing the growth in us. And all we do is trust you with the faith of a child. Father, we ask that you help us bring these wonderful truths out to a lost and dying world that needs to be set free so desperately. We ask these things in Christ's precious name, by the power of the Spirit, we pray. Amen.